Okay, let's bring on board then three special guests who are joining in to walk us through what they're making of uh, the current queues, both in the local and uh, global markets. Amit Nigam of Peerless Mutual Fund. We've got Madhur Jar of uh, Standard Chartered Bank. And from New York, Guraj Singh Sangha, who's a senior global macro portfolio manager, joins in on the phone line as well. Uh, all three of you, thank you uh, so much for taking time out for us. Uh, Guraj, let me begin by actually asking you about what's happening in your part of the world. You know, you've of course had a trading off for three days and extended weekend this is the first time in almost five days that you've seen wall street open lower what are these concerns that seem to have resurfaced what's fueling it you think right uh, as i mentioned uh, you know the manufacturing data uh, from china and uh, like a few other regions of the world continues to indicate growing weakness or at least a minimum and amelioration in strength and also uh, what's happening uh, in Europe is, you know, the continued fallout from the Brexit vote. Uh, particularly, there seems to be an increased uh, number of funds facing liquidity concerns, and that's tending to reverberate through the market, and the U.S. market is picking up on that cue and also starting to weaken a bit. Um, you know, these things are, the Brexit fallout is probably going to take several months to fully digest into the markets and in that interim the trading is likely going to be can continue to be quite volatile. Guraj, I want you to tell us how exactly are the risks right now, you know, now that big rally happened last week and some amount of profit taking is understandable but the unconfirmed reports suggest that some of the large funds mainly invested in real estate around Britain are stopping redemptions and some other liquidity concern may have emerged at other agencies. Uh, you know, this is actually triggering some amount of panic or some amount of elevated concern that are we heading into a position like Lehman-like moment? Do you think that it's too much to jump to that kind of a conclusion uh, and liquidity is not that tight in the region? Yeah, I, I think it's, I, you know, I've seen the analogy made and I, you know, from the way that I view markets as, as complex systems, I don't think this point in time is the appropriate moment for either a Bear Stearns or Lehman type uh, catalyst, which triggers a major uh, fallout in, in global markets. I think what's happening is, uh, you know, by virtue of the, the vote that occurred with Brexit, uh, there are many investors who are reassessing their involvement in Britain, and as you know, one or two start to redeem uh, their investments, it's just starting creating a domino effect. Now, what happened back then in terms of Lehman, uh, there was a derivative issue, and, and the, the counterparties involved with derivatives never expected a major clearinghouse to fail. That situation doesn't exist at this moment. Um, that type of situation is probably going to rise later, uh, more due to sovereign debt. Uh, you know, that there's over $12 trillion in debt in, in, uh, with negative yields. Those type of issues, I think, will be the catalyst for a Lehman or, or Bear Stearns type uh, movement, but later on, not at this point. But right now, you know, investors are continuing to reassess uh, their involvement in the UK. And on a wider scale, what is the impact for Europe? Because there's been a number of movements uh, within, uh, you know, I guess somewhat fringe political parties in Europe who've who've been uh, looking for an opportunity to take their countries out of the European Union. You know, for example, Italy and Spain, things of that nature. It's given a boost for those type of movements, and I think that creates a greater risk with respect to movement of capital out of Britain and out of the out right. of uh, Europe on a wider scale into the U.S. and other places. That, right. I think, is a much more Guraj, tangible risk. Guraj, let me interrupt you there. In fact, you know, I wanted to talk to you about it. Italian banks are the ones which took the big uh, cut in today's session as far as uh, the European markets are concerned. In fact, uh, the financial stability report coming out of Europe clearly mentions that things are not very stable. That may have also spooked traders. How are you analyzing the commentary from there? And how badly is that region uh, at risk of economic recession? Ba the bond yields are also crashing there. Right. The, the, the Italian banks for, for many months have uh, continued to see weakness in their balance sheets, in part due to a continuing deflationary uh, fallout from what's happened in Europe over the past several years. So they're in, in, in somewhat of a precarious situation, and and the the Italian authorities are essentially trying to circumvent current EU rules with respect to uh, bailing out banks, with so creating tension between the Italian government and the and the European Central Bank, and that you know on on balance that's a negative. 
those banks, uh, you know, need help. And then the, and a bailout is going to be required one way or another. It's just a question of what form it takes. And that type of bailout will continue to weigh on the European currency. The, you know, the secondary effect with respect to that is that um, many of the Italian banks, as well as banks throughout Europe, have loaded up on European sovereign debt because it's given a zero risk rating. A win and if, which is going to eventually there will be a win when the the yields with respect to uh, European debt start to rise, that will create increasing pressure on the on uh, it, it, European financial institutions, and that will be sort of the second wave of uh, of a banking crisis, which will begin in Europe. Let's let's get Madhur in on this discussion as well. Madhur, the other thing is, you know, what you heard the Bank of England governor say today. He's warned of challenging risks to financial stability following the Brexit uh, vote. Of course, he's also uh, sort of kick-started that entire stimulus process. A lot of folks, uh, you know, in the markets are banking now and concerted central bank action. How much is it that central banks can actually do, you think, to sort of stem this volatility? Well, clearly this is something which should be have more of a political project because this is all about negotiations between the, the whichever new UK government comes into power and the European Union as to what the new relationship will look like once uh, Brexit happens. And that is a long uh, political negotiation process which at best, as I said, will take uh, about two years but could take even longer. In the interim, support will have to come from central banks, not just in the UK but across the world in terms of uncertainty you'll see central banks having to do much more so uh, what we do expect from the Bank of England is a very dovish uh, approach towards monetary policy we are looking for them to cut the um uh, the, the policy rate by 25 basis points at the August meeting and they will obviously continue to say that uh, you know, all options are on the table they could start buying uh, or they could start the QE program again to provide uh, support to the markets because the the underlying concern will remain one on what's going to happen to economic growth in the UK uh, there's just too much uncertainty you're already seeing before the Brexit vote happened some of the indicators of economic activity were already beginning to slow down uh, and that's only going expected to actually continue over the next few quarters and that's why the central bank will have to provide uh, more monetary stimulus uh, to be able to take off some of the risk of, uh, of the economy falling into recession. Amit, please do come in. You know, we did, of course, uh, see these worries sort of resurface and those to some extent played out for us as well, where, you know, that six-day up move has sort of come to a bit of a halt. Do you that given this we're going to see near-term uh, correction both locally and globally uh, so uh, we have seen a good a smart recovery in our equity markets uh, post uh, the budget correction that we had and also after the uh, brexit event that we uh, saw about few days ago uh, now this has happened as a result of uh, good earnings that we saw reported by the Indian corporates in the fourth uh, quarter of the last financial year. Uh, also, it has been followed with a good uh, initial round of monsoon that we have seen. So the monsoon, uh, as per the prediction from the different agencies, is uh, progressing uh, on the ground or at the levels that were thought. So uh, I think all these put together has led to a recent, uh, a pretty decent rally in our equity markets. Now, uh, the way, the place that we stand today, we are looking at uh, the valuation multiples at the index level of the large caps at about uh, 17 and a half, 18 times one year forward. Uh, now, these are uh, pretty much in line with our long term averages, uh, but the only caveat that uh, we have is that the earnings growth would probably uh, be softer than what the initial estimates of the market are. Right. Amit, uh, talk to us about uh, how the earnings picture is uh, looking. Uh, do you think there is some amount of revival in the offing and if yes, is it in the price? Uh, so, uh, uh, the last quarter which went by, March quarter, uh, was one of the quarters where we saw uh, a sales growth for example Bef even before we talk about the earnings growth let's look at the sales growth number uh, it was a positive number after four uh, consecutive negative numbers uh, at the top line level and this i'm talking about the nifty index now this essentially uh, uh, transpired because we saw 
a scenario uh, after many many years that india nominal gdp growth slowed down to less than 10% india historically has done about a 13 14 or in fact even 15% kind of a nominal gdp growth the sales of any company responds to the nominal uh, sales growth uh, to, to the nominal gdp than to the real gdp and this is what has been a, a, a differentiating factor uh, in the corporate earnings and the gdp growth uh, so a real gdp growth at 7% plus does not translate into a very uh, robust earnings growth uh, is explained by this phenomenon Uh, however in the last quarter we saw uh, after four quarters of uh, sales decline earnings uh, uh, sales and therefore the earnings also do much better i mean if one were to look a little a longer term beyond the 2 3 quarter game one year plus how robust does the equity story look for india because all the other uh, you know markets are quite crumbling uh, not very really backed by a lot of fundamentals this one of course the earnings revival is visible now so how concrete is it uh see i think uh, indian equity markets are uh, poised extremely well over uh, over next 2 uh, to 3 years and uh, this confidence emanates from the fact that we are largely consumer driven uh, we are uh, 125 crore population uh our gdp per capita is now in the range of almost 2000 uh, dollars per annum that's a number where we have seen globally uh, and across economies we have seen that the dispo- that the discretionary spend of consumers goes up at an exponential pace uh since our uh, non discretionary expenses are taken care of therefore the surplus that is left with consumers takes off big time also the kind of uh policy initiatives that has happened from the government in the last 2 years and more so in the recent few months if we see is something which would probably going ahead trigger investments which in turn could feed consumption uh, in a very virtuous cycle therefore over next 2 to 3 years i think india as a country uh, is poised extremely well uh, for the companies to deliver good earnings growth and therefore the uh, stock price performance if it were to replicate that would give a great wealth creation opportunity mm-hmm. you know i mean the other uh, worry is that growth remains rather anemic globally just how much of a concern is that for our own economy how are you viewing it so uh, you are right uh, globally things are still not uh, uh, very stable uh, so brexit to us was a political event uh, unfortunately uh, most of the market participants had not positioned themselves for a vote which was the way it was casted that is uh, britain to leave eu and therefore we saw a knee jerk reaction uh, on that day when the vote was announced however if you see uh, in the last one week most of the asset classes have re- so at least indian markets they have recovered uh, even you even uk if you see has gone above the levels equity market uh, sorry their equity markets that i'm referring to has gone above those levels so we will keep seeing such events uh, play out here uh, once in a while uh, and therefore what we do is we tend to focus not so much on the markets or the global eco- uh, economies uh, and their events but more on the companies that we are going to invest in Uh, what kind of business models do they have uh, are these the companies which have good uh, uh, products do they enjoy pricing power uh, do they have good return ratios how are their cash flows and how do they uh, the same look when i project them in the future right uh, you know madhur there's so much being said about how economies like india have what it takes to be able to uh, sort of weather this global shock that we seem to be bracing ourselves for what's the call on emerging markets especially india from a macro standpoint uh so our expectations for emerging markets are still very much quite uh, very much positive we've got we at the beginning of the year we had made a call on three things for why we expect emerging markets to do well the first call was that the fed would not be raising rates as aggressively as markets were pricing in we've been pretty much uh, on target with that call and in fact we think that the fed's already done the tightening it had to do the second call we took was that uh, if you remember the beginning of the year in january markets were extremely volatile and very worried 
about the possibility of a hard landing in China. Now that again has not materialized. It was a view we took that China is going to be stable. It's going to remain slow. It's going to see slow growth by Chinese standards, uh, but it's not going to see a, a major collapse. And again, we are beginning to see evidence of that coming through where China's growth is stabilizing. We've got a lot more fiscal stimulus coming through from China, a lot more monetary policy support coming through in China. So again, we're expecting stable growth. And the third call we had was that oil prices would rebound. And if you compare to the January lows, you can see that oil prices are much higher. Now, these three factors together mean that the emerging market story remains very positive. They're all quite supportive of both risk appetite. They're also supportive of the general growth outlook for emerging markets. All right, Mother, we'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Both of you, Amit and Mother, thank you so much for taking time out for us. Let's uh, take a breather from all the market chatter. Cross over to Krishna Kumar, who's here to talk to us about what's grabbing national stories. Of course, it's uh, PM Modi's new look cabinet amongst many.